We're talking today with Don Oderkirk of Walter, Waterfleet, Michigan. Uh, the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Don, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? Okay, I was born in Rochester, New York, and I grew up in a small town. Uh, I had 55 students in my high school class, a uh, small class in a suburb of, well, about 20 miles from Rochester, New York, and on the Finger Lakes. And I went to Olivet College in Michigan. What, what year were you born? I was born in 41. Okay. Uh, and I graduated high school when I was 18. And I, 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 I worked on my uncle's farm for six months milking cows. Mm -hmm. I was going to go to Cornell University and become an uh, agricultural extension person. And they had a requirement that you need to live on a farm for six months before you could enroll. But then I, I decided I didn't want to be a farmer or, or in agriculture, so I went to Oliver College here in Michigan uh, because it was a small school, uh, majored in biology, uh, graduated in 64. Uh, after I graduated, I went to Michigan State for one term, and then I got my draft notice. And when I got my draft notice, I, I didn't want to be in a foxhole, so I uh, went down to Grosseal Naval Air Station and I enlisted in the Navy in January of 60... 65 by then? 65, yeah. And I, when I was there, the, the officer in charge said, well, you're a college graduate, why don't you take this? I enlisted. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and he said, uh, take this test for Oscar Candy School, and if you pass the test, instead of going to Great Lakes, you go to Newport, Rhode Island. So I took the test, and I passed it. And he said, well, instead of going to Great Lakes in March, you're going to go to Newport in April or May. And so I went through uh, four months of Osher Candidate School in Newport, Rhode Island. Okay. Talk about that. Uh, what did that actually consist of? Well, it was pretty rigorous. Uh, we had 20 in my company that started uh, uh, in, in, in Osher Candidate School, and only 15 of us got commissioned. Five didn't make it through. It was a pretty rigorous. And I had to work pretty hard. Uh, uh, the most difficult thing I had was swimming. You, know, you had to swim like a half a mile, and, and you had to jump off a 40-foot uh, um, platform mm -hmm. into the water with your with your uniform on, and take off your uniform and swim. And I, I actually the uh, uh, the swimming was the most difficult part for me. But uh, when I got I filled out what they called a dream sheet, and I. My roommate at Oliver well, College. Let's do a little bit more here with that, um, with the officer training. So there's, there's physical training and the, so the swimming and, and that kind of thing. And what else are they teaching you there? Well, we had academic training and, and various and, uh, uh, navigation skills and whatever. And then we also had uh, uh, physical training. We had to run a mile and a half before breakfast every morning. Uh, I was never first in line for breakfast. Um, and we also had rifle uh, training where we just uh, fired a like a 30 caliber rifle. That was about our only. And then we had to march in morning and night. We had to march down for uh, colors to raise the flag in the morning and uh, bring the flag down in the afternoon. And uh, I got through, but I, I didn't do very well. A lot of my classmates were uh, Ivy League guys, mm -hmm. and uh, I think I was number four. 13 or 14 uh, out of the 15 that graduated because I, my roommate was from uh, Dartmouth University and he was a valedictorian of his class and uh, he, 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 he graduated and went on to nuclear power school. Uh, uh, when I graduated I, through, through Osher Candy School, uh, I had requested a small ship in Southeast Asia. My roommate in Olivet was from Korea and he was very thankful about the United States being involved in the Korean War, so I was sort of curious about Southeast Asia, so I, I asked for a small ship in Southeast Asia, and that's, that's what I got. At uh, the point you were doing that, were you thinking at all about Vietnam? Yes, I knew, I knew, I'd said, I knew a little bit about it, not a whole lot, mm -hmm. but I sort of figured that's where I was going to wind up. Uh, this was in... Uh, oh, it's 65. So. Yeah, this is late, six, early 66, and okay. Vietnam was starting to warm up. Uh, the ship I went to was an LSMR landing ship medium rocket. Uh, we were only had seven feet of draft, and 
a small crew. We had about 120 enlisted and I think six officers. And I went aboard as communications officer in San Diego uh, after they finished refresher training. These ships were built for the invasion of Japan in 1945, which mm -hmm. didn't happen. There was 40 of them in Pearl Harbor when they dropped the atomic bomb. And uh, they brought most of them back and scrapped them, but five of them they put in mothballs up in Bremerton, Bremerton, Washington. And the St. Francis River, the one I was on, was one they had put in mothballs. So they brought it out uh, and recommissioned it and put new uh, new equipment on. Matter of fact, we had some of the, the best uh, radio equipment uh, in the Seventh Fleet because it was it was new stuff. Uh, our uh, uh, type our not typewriters, but our printers went 66 words per minute, which back in those days was considered pretty good. So we left in uh, February, I think, of 66, and it took us about 40 days to get to Da Nang. We stopped in Hawaii for a week. We stopped in Midway for a couple of days. We stopped in Guam for a couple of days. And uh, we wound up in, San, in uh, Da Nang, Vietnam in March. Well, what was the weather like on that voyage? I got real seasick. We had a typhoon between, uh, the ship was flat bottom, so mm -hmm. it was sort of rough riding. And between uh, Pearl Harbor and Midway, we went through a bit of a typhoon. And I, I was seasick for three days. I stayed in my bunk and all I ate was crackers uh, and water. And I, I, was, I began to wonder, what am I doing here? But after the storm went by and we went, we had a little picnic uh, in on Midway Island, uh, I got feeling better, and from then on, the, the weather was pretty good, except when I got to Vietnam, uh, our ship uh, did naval gunfire support uh, close in. Our, our rockets only had a range of 5,000 yards, so we had to be pretty close to shoreline. And we worked with the Koreans, I believe it was the Tiger Division in Northern Tukor. Uh, the Koreans uh, really liked our, our uh, gunfire. And then every six months, they'd send us back to Japan for one month uh, mini overhaul, and uh, we on the way back we stopped in Hong Kong, which probably was the highlight of my time. I really enjoyed Hong Kong. I think I was there three times for about a week. Uh, we go back. We'd go back to Japan and have a, what they called a mini overhaul. Then they send us back. And I think I made six, five, five trips back and forth. Okay. And we, back, uh, back up a little bit here. Back to, to the ship itself. So basically, this is the, like the same the same hull as an LST. About half the size of an LST. It's smaller than LST. Yeah, half the size. We weighed about a thousand tons, where an LST is about two thousand tons. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were originally LSMs, landing ship mediums, and they yeah. were designed to land in World War II. They were designed to land tanks mm -hmm. uh, on the beach. Right. Uh, so we were, we only we were only were two hundred two hundred seven feet long, uh, and uh, we had a seven foot draft, and I think we were thirty four feet wide. So it was pretty close quarters. We had a crew of 115, 120, and f five officers. This, our s captain was just a lieutenant. Right. Uh, I was the I was the youngest. I was the most junior. I was an ensign at the time, ensign Odekirk. So what was your your initial duty then? What would you at do? that time, I was communication officer. I was involved in uh, communications of uh, uh, the Seventh Fleet and back and forth, and also. I stood watch on the bridge eight hours a day. Uh, I, I had the uh, 12 noon to 4 in the afternoon and midnight to 4 in the morning, the mid, what they call the mid watch. And uh, for three years I was, uh, I spent eight hours on the bridge during the uh, middle of the night and the middle of the day. And then during the daytime I'd have my work to, to do at the, uh, in communications and we had, we had to encrypt a lot of our communications were encrypted in codes, and I, I was involved in doing the encryption and decryption. And uh, our, our probably our most dangerous experience, we wound up in the rivers down. We were we were called the Brown Water Brown Water Navy. Uh, down in the Mekong River Delta has about five rivers that are pretty big. And this one river we went up and we stayed, we were at a swift boat base called Cat Low, uh, up from Vung Tau, which is a beautiful French built uh, mm -hmm. town right on the ocean. But about 30 miles up the river was a swift boat base, swift, swift boat base called uh, Cat Low. And we operated for a 
couple weeks out of there and did an we did it we did an amphibious landing uh, and uh, the current in the river was at ebb tide when the tide is going out to the ocean uh, the the current was like 10 knots well that was like our maximum speed so we had to drop anchor when the when the tide was going out and uh, we dropped anchor this one one occasion and uh, we had a a swift boat come, bo uh, come aboard on our, our port side and a Coast Guard cutter on our starboard side and they came aboard for ice cream because we had ice cream and this this was about two days after the amphibious landing well uh, after about 15 or 20 minutes of these boats being tied up alongside of us we got hit with uh, uh, rocket propelled grenades and uh, the, the boats both the swift boat was on our port side, which was away from the, the beach where the where the rounds came from. But the uh, Coast Guard cutter, the Point Kennedy, uh, got the roof blown off of it with a rocket propelled grenade. Nobody got hurt, fortunately. Uh, and uh, two days later, we we got moved out of the river and went back out out to Cameron Bay, where we re rearmed and refueled, and uh, uh, we spent the rest of our time pretty much in. What was called Southern I Corps and Northern Two Corps, Cape Batangan, uh, mm -hmm. working for the Koreans and also for the uh, uh, for the Americans. I think it was the uh, um, I'm not sure what division it was. Well, you landed in 23rd Division there. Is it First Armored, I think, or something like well, there that? There was a there was a First Cavalry Regiment, which was an armored cavalry unit that was in that area. That might have been and they were often served with the American Division, which was the yeah. 23rd. We also worked with the Marines out of, uh, uh, our spotter most of the time was a Marine. He was in a, like a Piper Cub, mm -hmm. and he would be our, do a spotting for our targets. And uh, he was out of, not, not, not Da Nang, the next but place. Chulai? Ch Chulai, yes. Yeah. He, he flew out of Chulai, and we operated mostly about 40, 50 miles south of Chulai. One of my most interesting experiences is that uh, we operated with the, the swift boats would go out and it, uh, a lot of these junks, uh, Chinese junks, would come down from the uh, North Vietnam and they would, uh, uh, a few of them would bring weapons and stuff from North Vietnam and the swift boats went out and they, out of about 20 sandpans that they investigated, they found two or three, three of them I think, that had weapons on board. So. They brought the crew aboard our ship, and then this uh, Korean colonel flew in on a helicopter and landed. Uh, he couldn't land on the ship. He had to climb down a, a rope ladder. And uh, uh, he picked out uh, two or three of these young men that were on these uh, sandpans that had the weapons and uh, took them up in a helicopter and interviewed them and asked them for details. Well, the first man they talked to wouldn't tell them anything, and so they pushed him out of the helicopter. And the second and third men, and they were just maybe 18 to 20 years mm -hmm. old, uh, the, the second third men, they sort of spilled their guts and told where the stuff was going. Well, the Koreans pushed them out of the helicopter as well, uh, which was sort of traumatic for me because I was, since my roommate in college was Korean, I knew a few Korean words, so mm -hmm. I was the Korean guns, uh, gunfire support officer. and. Uh, that sort of upset me. Well, anyway, we went down about 20 miles south to this small uh, village on the coast that had a uh, a small harbor, and we we I I went I went on the captain's gig. The captain's gig is a small uh, like an outboard, uh, and we went uh, with some special uh, special forces troops into this little on this pier in this little village along the coast. And uh, my job was to stay with the ship, the, with the gig, and that's about the only time I wore a 45 caliber mm -hmm. gun. And uh, on the end of the pier, there was this man jigging for crabs. He was uh, uh, had a five-gallon bucket, and he was trying to catch crabs off the end. So I walked down to the end of the pier, which wasn't very long, and I got I talked to him, and he he spoke perfect English. He spoke French. He also spoke Vietnamese, and he was a retired school teacher. And uh, after about two or three minutes of talking to him, I noticed that two of the crabs had their claws on the top of the five-gallon plastic bucket. And I said to him, I said, 
you know, you better be careful because your crabs are going to escape. And he said, well, don't worry. Crabs are like people. When you get near the top, somebody tries to pull you back down. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, the other crabs that were down, were down lower pull the top crabs back, back down. And that was one of the more uh, intellectual discussions I think I had uh, when I was in Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, where did you go first in Vietnam? Did you, did you go into... Did you go to Da Nang first? Yeah, we pulled into Da Nang uh, to refuel. We burned uh, uh, diesel fuel, and uh, we pulled into Da Nang. As a matter of fact, one of the things that really impressed me, the, I had the mid-watch uh, 12 in the, at midnight to 4 in the morning before we pulled into Da Nang, and we were maybe 20 miles off the coast, and the, the sky and the western sky just lit up with, mm -hmm. with there were bombs being dropped by B-52s. It was called Operation Overlord, I believe. And I said to myself, Odekirk, what are you getting yourself into? This looks pretty serious. It was sort of like I'd seen movies of World War II and World War I with all the uh, uh, shells going off. Well, I went down to my bunk and I slept for about three hours. And at 7 or 8 in the morning, we pulled into Nang Harbor. And it was the most peaceful scene that I saw. There was these women paddling these small sand pans trying to sell us fruit and vegetables and it was very peaceful looking and I said to myself would you have a nightmare mm -hmm. uh, so anyway we pulled in and we went to the fuel pier and I guess my academic claim to or my uh, athletic claim to fame is that the officer in charge of the fuel pier was Roger Staubach uh, who graduated from Naval Academy a few years earlier and he had a football under his arm and I was standing on the fan tail or the rear of the ship and he threw me the football once and I passed it back to him and he threw it again and it was a little harder and, and I looked down at the water in the river and Da Nang Harbor was really nasty looking. And so after, after I threw back the second pass I sort of waved him off and said, I've got to go down below, I've got some duties to do. And uh, I didn't know who he was mm -hmm. but I went down uh, to the mess decks right below the fan tail and the executive the executive officer was down there said, you know who you're playing catch with? I said, no, but he throws a hard football. He said, well, that was Roger Staubach. Mm -hmm. So that's my, my my athletic claim to fame is I caught two passes by Roger Staubach. And after that, he went to the Dallas Cowboys for mm -hmm. quite a few years. Right. Uh, now, when you went into Da Nang that first time, did you go ashore or just stay on the ship? Uh, I st pretty much stayed on the ship. We, we tied up at a pier. We refueled at this on the fuel piers, but I don't believe I went ashore. I think I stayed aboard ship. Uh, I think we all did uh, uh, because they, they just took the hoses. The uh, the fuel people just sort of threw the uh, fuel hoses aboard ship, and we just attached them to our fuel tanks. And mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody, the captain might have gone ashore briefly or something, but but I didn't. Okay. Uh, now describe a little bit just sort of the way the ship operated militarily. You've got. Set of rocket launchers on it, or yes, we had we had uh, uh, eight, f four on the starboard side and four on the port side uh, rocket launchers that fired five-inch spin-stabilized rockets. They were uh, uh, the warhead was about a foot long, and the propellant and the rear of it was about eighteen inches, and they were, they were spin-stabilized. And when they leave the rocket launcher, they were spinning. And most of them had what they call point detonating fuses. And like I said, our longest range rocket was 5,000 yards. Mm -hmm. our, our best rocket was 2,000 yards. That had a, a warhead of about two feet and a propellant of about one foot. Uh, so the shorter range rockets had more warhead mm -hmm. and less propellant. And it's the five inches at the diameter of the rocket? Yes, it's five inch. <clears throat> we also had a five inch 38 naval rifle. Uh, that we used, but we had to fire reduced rounds because the ship was pretty small and if we fired a full round out of our 5-inch 38 ri uh, rifle, our, our electronic equipment would go out of whack. So we fired uh, reduced, what they call reduced rounds, and mostly it was uh, white phosphorus, uh, we called it Willie Peter. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at night we'd use it to illuminate, illuminate the sky, and we also had uh, we used on a few occasions a 40 to twin 40 millimeter, uh, I guess machine guns. Up there. Well, they're, they're cannon, but they can be they're yeah. fairly rapid fire. Yeah, they're rapid fire. We had two on the on the bow and two on the stern, uh, and a two a pair on each bow and the stern. 
and we use those on a few occasions to uh, uh, destroy uh, sand pans up on the beach that we suspected were bringing stuff down from uh, from North Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also had some, uh, a couple of 50 caliber machine guns that we never really used too much, but they were on the one on the port side and one on the starboard side. And uh, uh, we used those on a couple of occasions. And uh, matter of fact, speaking of 50 caliber machine guns, uh, I think I was over there about two months and uh, I had the mid-watch between midnight and four in the morning. And we were close enough to shore where we, we got shot at by a uh, 50 caliber. And these uh, tracer rounds, they came, so it looked like real slow. We were maybe, a hundred yards off the beach, and uh, these tracer rounds looked like, you know, they it looked like it took about two sec, three seconds for them to come from the beach to go over the ship. Uh, none of us, none of the tracer, none of them hit us. But my junior officer in the deck was a, ch a chief petty a petty officer who'd been in World War II, uh, Chief uh, Banks, I believe. And anyway, he'd been in Okinawa in World War II, and I said to him, uh, if I had a, a fishnet, a steel fishnet, I could reach up and catch one of these rounds. He said, he said, Ensign Odekirk, between each of those tracer rounds, there's four that aren't tracer rounds. Mm -hmm. He said, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't last very long. And that was sort of a little bit of a humbling experience for me to have this real experienced uh, uh, chief bosun mate that he was. He sort of straightened me out a little bit and realized that I was pretty much a rookie. Mm -hmm. Now, in this case, did your ship fire back? No, that was a, a, that, on that particular occasion. We we didn't. Uh, yeah, I think we did our forty millimeter forward, for, forty millimeter fired back a little bit where the tracer rounds were coming from, but uh, they were. Uh, uh, it only lasted for 30, 40 seconds or right. so. It didn't last very long. Uh, and I think. Uh, Maybe one of the one of the 40, 50 caliber rounds hit. We had a dent. We had a little dent in the front of the ship on the bow of the ship. I think one of the rounds uh, uh, hit the ship, and uh, but didn't didn't penetrate the ship. The, the hull was what quarter inch steel, I believe, and we were far enough off the beach where uh, that that 50 caliber didn't have. I'm not sure up close even if a 50 caliber would penetrate a quarter inch steel. Right. It didn't have enough velocity at the point that it hit you, did it? That's right, because we were out about a thousand yards, uh, well, maybe 500 yards off the beach. And I think it was just some Viet Cong or North Vietnamese were just trying to hassle us a little mm -hmm. bit and keep us keep us alert. Okay. Uh, How yeah. common was it to take fire from shore anywhere? I think about three times along the beach up in southern i -Corps, we took some uh, small arms rounds. Mm -hmm. And then our, our, our most dangerous situation was down, as I mentioned before, down the river where the rocket propelled grenades, I think five of them came across. And I was on watch up on the bridge when this happened. And the first round went over the, went over the top of the ship. The second round and, and landed in the water about 50 yards on the port side of the ship and exploded. Uh, and the second round uh, went across the front of our ship and hit uh, a steel railing and sort of flip-flopped and uh, landed in the water about 20 yards from the uh, bow of the ship and exploded. The third round hit this uh, uh, Coast Guard cutter called the Point Kennedy mm -hmm. and it sort of it made the top of the, it was aluminum superstructure and it sort of made it look like a salt shaker. <laughs> The fourth, about that time, our front, our 40 millimeter rounds in front, went into the area where the, these, probably, I don't know, 300 yards, two, 300 yards away, and our forward, our, our 40 millimeter went in and, and really hit the area pretty hard. And the next day, some special forces uh, troops went into the area uh, where these rounds came from. It was the mangrove swamp, mm -hmm. and. Uh, they didn't find any bodies, but they found some blood, uh, blood and some uh, some material laying around. So uh, apparently, whoever had done this uh, paid a bit of a price for it, uh, and we were fortunate that nobody really got you know, damaged aboard ship. Matter of fact, a small world story: the uh, the officer in charge of the PT boat that was uh, he came up on the bridge 
and we were talking on the bridge when, for about five minutes before this happened. And uh, the, when you're overseas in the military, one of the first things you say to somebody is, you know, where are you from? Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm from St. Joe, Michigan. And I said, well, I, I went to college in Olivet, Michigan. I know, I know where St. Joe is. And his name was Pete Rowe. He was officer in charge of the swift boat, number 90, 98, I believe it was. And uh, uh, when the when the ground blew up on the coast Guard, on the Coast Guard cutter, he he bailed out. He and his crew got on the swift boat and mm -hmm. vanished because uh, it was at night. And uh, about seven years later, when I was in reserves drilling over at Fort Custer, uh, maybe it was eight years later, uh, I bumped into him and we sort of looked at each other like you know we've seen each other before, but when was it? Well, then we got talking and. And it was sort of strange that here about eight years later we, we sort of met each other again after that. Because the first time we, we talked maybe for ten minutes. Uh, and uh, anyway, it's sort of a personal story that sort of uh, Im impressed me is how you can run into somebody that, you know, from your local area. And then later on I, you know, hooked up with them again. Sure. Uh, so that was good. Now, about how, what proportion of your time did you actually spend working with swift boats as opposed to just going up and down the coast? Why, two or three days a month, we, we the swift boats would round up these sand pans, mm -hmm. and we'd throw out, uh, off, off our stern, we'd throw off a, a long cable, and the swift boats would tie the sand pans, sometimes 20 or 30 of them, up to this cable, and we'd tow them uh, to an area where they got interrogated. Uh, that was probably twice, I don't know, I'm going to say twice a month. So these uh, are sandpans that have people in them? Oh, they all have people in them, yes. Okay. And uh, a number of them were women, they had women in them as well. Uh, matter of fact, on one occasion, they, an Air Force uh, plane had uh, picked up this one sandpan and, and uh, shot at it and uh, badly wounded two or three of the people on board. As a matter of fact, our ship went out and w one of the people wounded was, was a female. And, and then the other one was a young male, maybe 12 years old, 10 years old, and our, our corpsman aboard ship uh, sort of patched them up mm -hmm. and tried to uh, save their life. And I'm not sure uh, after he patched them up, they took off, and so I'm not sure whatever happened after that. But that was sort of sad to look down from the bridge and see the, the blood and stuff. Mm -hmm. that, uh, the, the swift boat was maybe 30 feet long, 20 or 30 feet long. Not the swift boat, I mean the sandpan. Sand yeah. But uh, I was fortunate that I didn't get to see a whole lot of, you know, blood and guts type of stuff. Uh, uh, we, we, you know, I, I, I'm thankful for that because there's a lot of people that saw some really things that haunt them today. Sure. And uh, I saw, you know, a few, uh, a few dead bodies and a few wounded bodies, but never, uh, uh, never really got terribly involved in like hand-to-hand -hand combat sure. type of thing. Okay. Now, when you were doing fire missions, if you're firing the rockets in support someplace, uh, how did that work? I mean, was you getting radio from someplace? Yeah, we had a spotter, airplane spotter, up in a, a small plane. Mm -hmm. I call it a Piper Cub. I'm not sure it was a Piper Cub or not. It was a, it was usually a marine, a marine spotter, and he would pick out these targets. Now, our, our rockets weren't that accurate, really. Uh, these rockets, uh, if you fired ten of them, one of them might hit the target. They didn't have the accuracy of a, of a naval rifle that's got the, mm -hmm. you know, spin to it. But uh, if there was a target the size of a, a football field, uh, if we fired 100 rounds, uh, probably half of them would land in the football field. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, our accuracy wasn't too good. And that's one reason the, the Koreans uh, liked us, because the Americans were a little paranoid about collateral damage, mm -hmm. mean killing innocent people, right. but the Koreans didn't didn't much care about that, and so that's one reason the Koreans use us use us probably at least half or two thirds of the time we were over there, um, and they they were very effective. Uh, nobody, matter of fact, this one Korean colonel looked like uh, for one of the early James Bond movies. There was a character named Odd Job, a very large bald man. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this colonel looked just like odd job. And uh, I, I went and spent a couple, two nights in their compound in, in northern Tukor. Uh, and they just moved in there. 
And I asked him, I said, do you carry any mortar rounds in at night? Because that, that was sort of a typical thing, mm -hmm. uh, that the Viet Cong would fire a couple of mortar rounds in to keep people, well, or maybe kill people, or at least mm -hmm. make them nervous. Uh, and this Korean colonel said, yes, first night, first night we get three mortar rounds in, we go out next morning and we shoot three young men. No more mortar rounds. So the Koreans had a, a by our standards, a bit ruthless, mm -hmm. but they were pretty effective, very effective. All right. Uh, now you also mentioned uh, you. So you're, go you're going back and forth. You're off the Vietnamese coast for a certain amount of time, and then you go s back to Japan or yes. to Hong Kong and, and so forth. Uh, talk about the trip to Hong Kong. What were you doing there? Uh, well, it was sort of on the way back. Uh, Hong Kong is about halfway. Well, not quite halfway. Maybe a third of the way between Vietnam and Yokosuka, Japan, mm -hmm. which is our home port, and uh, uh, for called R&R, &R, Rest and Recreation, we'd stop in Hong Kong on our way back. It was probably yeah, three to four days. Our ship didn't go very fast. It mm -hmm. took us uh, probably seven or eight days of sailing to go from Vietnam to Japan. And uh, we'd sort of split it in half and stop in Hong Kong for a couple, three days and have some, uh, rep, you know, I remember going, going out Victoria Peak and seeing uh, uh, things. We'd also refuel mm -hmm. uh, there as well. And uh, I know on one occasion, before we got to Hong Kong, we went, no, after Hong Kong, I guess it is. My cheap geography is not too good. Between Taiwan and China, we went between Taiwan and China, mm -hmm. and we went through a typhoon. And it was pretty, pretty, actually we, there was this boat that had capsized with China, I'm not sure, if they were national Chinese or Formosa Chinese, but there was a, we picked up these three or four survivors off this boat, fishing boat, mm -hmm. that had capsized in this uh, in this typhoon, and we took them into I think it's called Keelong on the north end of uh, uh, of Taiwan uh, and dropped them off, uh, and uh, then it was probably a three to four day trip from there up to Yokosuka, Japan. Now, I've heard some people say that when they went into Hong Kong, there was a service there that would paint the ship. Did that happen to you? That's right. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, for our, our 5 inch 38 naval rifle, the powder rounds were about three foot tall, and they were solid brass. And for, for 50 or 60 powder of these brass empty, after, mm -hmm. we could get our ship painted. And there were women that painted the ship, and they didn't use brushes, they used rags. And the paint job wasn't too good. They didn't do much preparation for mm -hmm. it. They didn't do much sanding or anything, but uh, the, the, our captain was uh, always wanted to show back up in Yakuska looking pretty sharp. And so these women in Hong Kong, for 50 or 75 of these brass uh, shell casings, would, would paint the ship in about a day and a half. And this, I, I know I was impressed by the fact that they they didn't use brushes, they used rags. And uh, uh, so we, we generally, our, 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 these 5 inch 38 powder, powder casings they were, uh, we'd hang on to them and the two or three times we went into Hong Kong, uh, we, used, we traded that to, to get our ship painted. And, uh, and we each got to spend a day or two, you know, in the city of Hong Kong and see some sights and whatever. Someday I'd like to go back to Hong Kong. I don't know if I ever will or not, but uh, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful city. All right. And then when you went up to Japan, what would happen up there? Well, we go into Yokosuka, which was a uh, naval base, and uh, we, we'd go through like a one-month overhaul. Uh, the, there were almost all, there were Japanese workers, and they'd come aboard and they'd redo our, our, our engines, and, and on, we had trouble with our uh, clutches on the, uh, we had, we had two engines, two diesel engines, and we had to have our clutches repaired uh, about each time we pulled in there. And it was sort of interesting, these Japanese workers that came aboard ship, uh, when they when they came aboard ship, they had a, they wore a sport coat and a, a, a suit or sport coat. And then they changed, they had a little bag, and they put their work clothes on. And then when they left the ship, they put their, their fancier clothes back on. And I was pretty impressed with uh, these 
basically yard workers that showed up looking like they were, uh, you know, uh, businessmen. Businessmen, <laughs> and when they left, the same way. So I was pretty impressed with uh, their work, and they got a lot of stuff done uh, in, in three or four weeks. You know, we'd get uh, our engines overhauled and. Uh, Another root, sort of routine maintenance because the ship did it was it was forty years old and it uh, uh, it needed some routine maintenance on different things. I know I know we had trouble with the clutches. They were the, the diesel engines were out of a, what they used in World War II submarines, and our, our engineering officer was a war officer who in World War II had been aboard a submarine mm -hmm. and he knew these engines and clutches inside now and uh, he was a great uh, uh, a great asset for us because he, he knew these engines uh, uh, like I said from top to bottom if I had been engineering an officer I wouldn't I wouldn't have known what to do right. now when you're in port um, would you go travel around Japan at all or do things on shore never did too much traveling in Japan mostly in Yokosuka uh, I, I was going to go to Mount Fuji one time but the weather turned bad and, and, and the trip got canceled in Mount Fuji. Uh, I went to uh, I went to Yokohama to see a baseball game. Uh, I forget now who it was. It was one of the American major league teams against the Japanese. Mm -hmm. It was in Yokohama, and that was about that was maybe thirty miles from Yokosuka, and that's about the only furthest I ever got out of Yokosuka. So how would you spend your time when you were in port? Well. Our, when we were in port, we were what they call port and starboard. We'd spend one day aboard ship, and the next day we, we were free to spend from like eight in the morning to eight at night, you know, in town. Mm -hmm. And we went to a number of bars, and uh, I, I went and saw a couple movies. Actually, they were English-speaking movies, uh, and uh, I, I did take some side trips around Yakuska to see some of the, you know, the suburbs type mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, but never really traveled too far through Japan. Okay. Uh, how did the Japanese seem to view the American servicemen? Oh, they they liked us because they got paid pretty good wages. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of like the Koreans, uh, the the Koreans in Vietnam got paid U.S. wages, and they were really really happy with that. And the the yard workers in Yokosuka in Japan, the Japanese workers got paid pretty good, and so they were they were very uh, happy to be working on. on U.S. ships. Uh, the United States spent a lot of money on, on maintenance of ships in, in, uh, in Japan mm -hmm. and uh, also in Subic Bay in, in the Philippines we went into once, once or twice. Uh, that, was a, that was a big a military base. And, uh, now the, the crew on your ship, uh, when they went ashore, would they behave themselves or some of them get in trouble? <laughs> Uh, yeah, some would get in trouble. Uh, uh, I remember a couple of times when I had duty, the, the uh, military police would bring these sailors back that were basically drunk, and they'd gotten into a fight or the, you know some scuffle or something like that, and uh, they were they, they drank quite a bit. Uh, uh, that was the big thing, you know, to go to these bars and and. Uh, you know, and get drunk basically, because mm -hmm. a lot of these our our sailors were 19, 20 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I was 25, 26 years old, so I was sort of an old man, so right. to speak. So I didn't really participate too much in, in this uh, uh, going bar to bar mm -hmm. type of thing. And they had different levels of bars. Uh, they had some bars were for mostly for officers, and some for were for enlisted. So the bars that I frequented or went into a few times uh, were basically designed for officers. They were just a little bit classier. Mm -hmm. Now, did they get in trouble with, with women too? Because oh yeah, uh, when we before we before we left uh, San Diego, uh, they they'd head down to Tijuana, Mexico, and I think my first or second week aboard ship. We had 20 of our crew had venereal disease, mm -hmm. and a couple of them had to be hospitalized. Well, we got over to Japan and the Philippines, 
and the VD rate dropped. Well, the reason was is the, the, the women in the bars and the prostitutes mm -hmm. had to be examined once a month. And they had to have a little card with them. And so even though these uh, our sailors were uh, frequenting the, the prostitutes and the, the, the bar girls, uh, the, the VD rate just about disappeared compared to uh, Tijuana mm -hmm. where there wasn't this, uh, these inspections of the, uh, uh, of, of the girls. Uh, we had, I had one radio man, no, a signalman, who uh, came down with a very serious uh, venereal disease and it, we, he got evacuated off the ship and I don't know whatever happened to him. But basically the, the VD rate overseas just about disappeared compared to back in San Diego. All right. Uh, now, during what time span were you um, in, in Southeast Asia or in that area going back and forth between Japan and Vietnam? Well, let me think here. i got to think back a few number of years. Because uh, I guess you well, April of 66. Mm -hmm. I was there from April of 66 to April of 68. Okay. In, in and out of Vietnam for, for two, two years. Okay. But we'd go back to Japan. Right three or four times in between. Now during that time, did you uh, get an R&R, &R, get to go home or anything like that, or were you just with the ship the whole time? I was with the ship the whole time. Well, actually, no, come to think of it, or towards the end, I, 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 had, I, earned about, I had about 30 or 40 days of leave, and I came back to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I got married. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, my, matter of fact, New Year's, it was New Year's Eve of 68, she and I flew back to, to from uh, Travis Air Force Base back to uh, uh, Yokohama, I think it was, it was in Yokosuka. Uh, and then we, re we rented a small house, and, and then my last, last three-month trip down to Vietnam, she, she roomed with another wife uh, in, 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 in Yokosuka. And so uh, I did come back to the States after a couple years and got married. And, we, our honeymoon, we went to New York City, as a matter of fact, and uh, it all seemed sort of strange, uh, like I had a time lapse type of thing, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it was a good experience. And then uh, when, when my, for my former wife was over there with me, we did a little bit, of, we went up to Nico to uh, uh, um, up in the mountains, so mm -hmm. to speak, and saw some of, the, some of the scenery. Actually, I saw more scenery with her than I did right. before. Okay. Uh, and then... Uh, let's see, now, are there other things that happened during that tour that you had in Asia that kind of stand out in your memory that you haven't brought into the story here yet? No, not really. The, um, I do remember uh, one of my officer friends, uh, Rich Merman, who lives in Denver, Colorado, uh, uh, we were shooting up these sand pans on the beach with our uh, 40 millimeters. and. They weren't terribly accurate, and so this, he was the operations officer, I was the communications officer. He suggested to the captain that, uh, why don't you send us ashore with some, you know, some uh, fuel oil and we'll burn these sand pans. So the captain said, okay, we'll do that. So they took the, the captain's gig uh, onto the beach, about seven men and then this rich merman, the, the officer in charge, and they set half a dozen of these sand pans on fire. Well, then all of a sudden, <laughs> these Vietnamese men showed up over the sand dune. Now, they, they didn't have guns with them, but it scared the dickens out of the uh, uh, people on the beach. And the captain's gig uh, got turned sideways in the surf, and, and it didn't sink, but it got full of water. Mm -hmm. So we had one of our enlisted men was a, a, a very good swimmer. I think he was... I'm not sure where he was from. Oh, he was from the Naval Academy, but he didn't make it through. After three years in Naval Academy, he got washed out. And um, he, he swam to shore with a small line behind him, and then they pulled this big rope. And they tied the rope to the captain's gig mm -hmm. and pulled it back uh, to the ship, probably uh, maybe 300 yards off the beach. Uh, and the six or eight men that were with him were sort of hanging on to the side of the uh, boat to, to get back and fortunately 
no, nobody got hurt, but it, it was a uh, sort of a scary situation. Okay. Now, once that uh, tour was complete, how much time did you have left to back of duty? Oh, I, I, they, the Navy wanted to keep me in uh, aboard ship for three years, and I didn't really wasn't too keen on it. But after the Tet Offensive, things sort of got sort of messy in Vietnam. We had to get before we took fire to the target. We had to get clearance from the local Vietnamese. We had to get clearance from uh, two or three people. It, it took us like six or eight minutes to take a target under fire. And so it sort of wasn't much fun anymore. So I agreed to extend in the Navy for another two years. And I, I asked for my, my wish list was a, a communication station in Iceland, a Naval Officer Candidate School in Newport, and I think someplace in Norfolk, Virginia, I forget where. But I, anyway, I got selected to go to Newport, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and so at that time I was married, and so my wife and I went back, and I spent uh, just about two years as an instructor at Oscar Candidate School in Newport, Rhode Island. And then in, in late 69, when, when things really started drawing down, uh, they gave me my choice. I could augment, I was U.S. Naval Reserve. Mm -hmm. And I could go U.S. Navy regular, and they were going to send me out to a, a reserve center in, in Utah. And I, we, we had a, a baby girl born about then, and I wasn't really too keen on that kind of life raising a child. So uh, I, I decided to be discharged, I think it was the 30th of November of 1969. Uh, when I got discharged in Newport and went back uh, back to my own town in Victor for a couple of weeks and then I went to Michigan State to graduate school. I used the GI Bill to get a master's degree in, aqu in aquatic biology okay. and then I had a career with county health departments uh, uh, inspecting restaurants and swimming pools and things like that. Okay. Go back to the time you're spending uh, as an instructor. What, what kinds of classes did you teach? I, I taught uh, actually communication school. Uh, oh, here's a, that's an interesting thing. Uh, in June, I went through uh, six weeks of training, and my first class was in June of '68, and they were all ROTC graduates. Well, one of them was Ensign Zumwalt, Admiral Zumwalt's son, mm -hmm. and he sat in the back of the back of the room and he sort of dozed off. So after the second day, I called him up after, after uh, class, and I said, you know, Ensign Zumwalt, you better start paying attention. He said, what are you going to do? Going to call my father? <laughs> he sort of put me in my place. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, to his credit, he started paying better attention, and he graduated pretty well in the class, and he wound up two or three years later on a swift boat in Vietnam, and he died of age, Agent Orange about four or five years later. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't think, his, his name was Elmo, same as his father. And uh, but that was sort of an interesting experience because I was, uh, when he told me, when he said to me after class, that, what are you gonna do, call my father? And his father was chief of naval operations right. at that time. And, and, and it sort of put me in my place, but to his credit, he did start paying attention and, and graduated uh, uh, not at the top of the class, but in the top half anyway. Did you enjoy the duty in Newport, or was that just a job? Yeah, I guess so. I you know, was married and had a, uh, my daughter was born at Newport Naval Hospital, and so uh, I had more domestic mm -hmm. issues going on almost than I did uh, Navy. I went to the Naval War College for a few, uh, a few sessions. That's located in Newport, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a friend of mine that was a, a former commanding officer was a, a student at the War College at the time, and I, I went to some classes with him because the War College was just a four or five blocks from where I was teaching. And uh, I liked Newport, and, and Newport at that time was a, sort of a Navy town, mm -hmm. sort of like San Diego, but uh, I went back to Newport a few years ago, and it's, it's a resort town. Yes, it is. And San Diego, likewise, has mm -hmm. turned into a resort town. Right. Okay. And to go back, uh, you mentioned just in passing about Vietnam for being there. Were you actually off the coast of Vietnam or in that area when the Tet Offensive started? Or no, we were back at, at when the Tet Offensive started. 
in late January, I guess it was, yeah. of what, 67? 68. Yeah. 68. We were just getting finished with a, a, a minor overhaul in Yakuska. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, the USS Pueblo was tied outboard of us. Well, the Pueblo was a reconnaissance ship. Mm -hmm. And the Pueblo left us. Matter of fact, I went one night and had supper with the officer, uh, officer of the deck on the Pueblo. And two days later, the Pueblo left and went off the coast of North, North Korea and got captured. Mm -hmm. And that got to be quite an international issue. But uh, uh, we, went, we got back to Vietnam in, I guess, early March, the middle of March. By that time, the Tet Offensive was pretty much over yep. with. And that's when things got pretty hairy. When we'd get a, a fire control mission, we had to get approval from the local Vietnamese, approval from the, uh, the Air Force, because they were worried about our rockets hitting some of their uh, aircraft. And because when, when we first arrived in Vietnam, if we saw a target of opportunity, we could take it under fire. Well, after the Tet Offensive, it, it all changed. And that's when I got a little bit discouraged. Plus, I'd been aboard for almost two and a half years by then, and I was getting there was a whole new group of people, and uh, uh, a lot of my good friends had left and gotten out. So that's when I decided to uh, uh, stay in an extra couple of years and go to Newport. Uh, yeah. So was there was there sort of a regular rotation of personnel off the ship while you were on it? Yeah, most, most uh, two, year, two, two years was sort of the standard mm -hmm. thing. I don't know why they, they sort of picked me to spend my full three years on it, but uh, most of the crew spent two years, uh, or maybe a little more than two years on board. And by the time I left, it was sort of a whole new... Right. Um, matter of fact, uh, our commanding officer uh, for the first year and a half aboard ship, Fred Mangle, uh, his sister married a nigh down here in Berrien County, uh, down, lives on Glenmore Road, uh, and he, he, he was an ROTC, ROTC graduate from Michigan State University, and he stayed, he's the only one of the five officers that stayed in the Navy and made it a career. The rest of us all got out after, well, I did about four years, but a lot of them just did three years. Okay. Um, how did you, or to what extent did you understand why we were in Vietnam in the first place? Well, as I mentioned earlier, my my roommate in college from Korea, and he was very thankful for the U.S. being involved in in the Korean War and sort of saving South Korea because he was born and raised in Busan, or known as Busan, mm -hmm. and uh, he sort of convinced me that that Vietnam was very similar to Korea. And at that time, there was what that concept of. Uh, Communism spreading down through. Matter of fact, there yeah. was the whole domino theory. Domino yeah. theory, yeah. Matter of fact, we operated with some Australian. There was Australian, a couple of Australian naval ships mm -hmm. that were doing a couple of cruisers. Matter of fact, from Austria, Australia, uh, and also the British were sort of. A couple times, I spent some time aboard a British minesweeper, but the British didn't didn't really get too involved in mm -hmm. things. But uh, the the Australians were concerned uh, with. Com, you know, the communists taking over Vietnam and then Indonesia and then moving down to mm -hmm. Australia. So that domino theory was a, uh, a factor in, in the 60s. Okay. Uh, and then when you got back home, uh, did you notice sort of much about the anti-war movement and popular views of the war? Not too much. I never had really too much of a bad experience except when I was going to Michigan State University, I. Uh, on Veterans Day, there was in Lansing. They had a parade mm -hmm. uh, down the main street. I think Grand River Avenue was called. And uh, in 1970 or 71, our Naval Reserve unit was marching down, and we had tomatoes thrown at us. And the next year, they didn't they didn't have a parade. Now I didn't get hit with a tomato, but it was sort of it was sort of depressing. And from that point on, they they didn't do a a parade on Veterans Day. Okay. Now, how long did you spend in the reserves? Another 15, about 15, 14 and a half, 15 okay. years. And what kinds of things did you do with that? Well, I drilled in Lansing for about four years while I was going to Michigan State, and also I worked in Clinton County at the, for the Health Department in St. John's, Michigan. And then when I moved down to Berrien County and took a job in Berrien County, it, uh, I drilled at Fort Custer in Battle Creek mm -hmm. for about seven years. 
or maybe six years. And then by, when I made when I made commander after ten or twelve years, uh, no more pay. Mm -hmm. So I had to, and also officers didn't get paid for uh, lodging or for transportation. Mm -hmm. But we carpooled it. There was a number of other uh, officers from this area. We carpooled it to Fort Custer back and forth. Well, after some of these guys were a bit older than me, um, I had a father-in-law in Grand Rapids that was in poor health, so I went up to Grand Rapids and I drilled for about two years in Grand Rapids and stayed Saturday nights, Friday and Saturday nights with my, my father-in-law who finally died. And then I spent my last year and a half in the reserves I finally figured out South Bend was closer, mm -hmm. and I spent my last year and a half in reserves drilling down in South Bend. And I was in what they called a volunteer training unit. We were just sort of, you know, putting in our time, so mm -hmm. to speak. So you, did you do any additional schools or oh, yes. sessions different places? Uh, my first five or six years in reserves, I, I, I had two, two weeks of training duty. And matter of fact, one of the things that still sort of bugs me is uh, when I was in Lansing, my first uh, two-week training duty was aboard the USS Enterprise, an aircraft carrier. Well, I'd never been aboard a ship anywhere near that size, and they had these exercises, nuclear power drill, I uh, forget what it was called, but I was about seven decks below the bridge where I was stationed, and I couldn't get, uh, the first time I tried to get to the bridge in time, these Marines were there with their rifles crossed, and I couldn't get to the you know, into the bridge. Mm -hmm. So the second time it happened, I just I just stayed in my bunk, and nobody came looking for me. But I took about 20 machinist mates down with me from Lant the Lansing area, and actually these machinist mates were worth more to the enterprise than than I was. Mm -hmm. And then I, I I did some training, do two week tours on some destroyers. One of them was a Spruance class destroyer. Back I think that was my last training duty after about seven years. And the Spruance class was gas turbine. And it could go, it could go from dead in the water to 20 mile, 20 knots in like a minute, and that just sort of blew me away. I mean, I, that's when I realized that, you know, I was uh, the the world had changed so much that uh, uh, the the way that ship could pick up speed, mm -hmm. uh, and also I, I spent a couple tours on the uh, it was an aircraft carrier with out of Pensacola. Yorktown, I think, I'm not sure, but uh, where they did training for pilots, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, I, I spent a couple tours down there. And then I went to the War College for a two-week period, uh, and I went to a, a, a tender in Charleston, South Carolina for a couple of years. But again, I'd go down with about 15 or 20 enlisted mm -hmm. uh, machinist mates and bosun mates, and they, they, they fit in better than I did. I was sort of Odd man out. So they had work to do, and you just were kind of there. Yeah, they put me. I my duty station was on the bridge, so I got to see what was going on. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't really, you know, I was sort of on the sidelines, I guess. Okay. Now to look back at the time that you spent in the Navy, uh, what do you think you took out of that, or how did that affect you? Well, I guess you know, respect for uh, people that serve their country. Number one. Uh, was really impressed with. Uh, matter of fact, when we first uh, went to Vietnam out of San Diego, uh, there's uh, a Navy ship has a, a wartime complement and a peacetime complement. In the wartime, there's more people during wartime, so they have, they got more people. And uh, about a week before we left San Diego, they marched about 20 of these enlisted men down that just got out of boot camp, and they were called Category Fours, and they. They were, most of them were from Philadelphia, and the judge had said to them, either go to, go in the military or go to jail. And these guys that came down the pier, you know, went to the, in the Navy to Great Lakes and came down, and we picked about eight or ten of them out of the twenty, and one of them that I picked uh, first, and he became a signalman, wound up staying in the Navy for thirty years. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Cronin, Austin Cronin, and he was one of the more sharpest guys. I he learned the, you know hand signals mm -hmm. within in 24 hours when I I never could learn <laughs> flags or hand signals. So I think my respect for the uh, people that served is was was, was a big thing. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Well, you've killed off successfully an hour of tape, and you've told a good story, so thank you very much for coming in. Okay, well, today. I thank you again. I just uh, uh, don't know how this compares to my first... Uh, uh,